Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 215. How do you integrate GraphQL into your Python web development? How about quickly building graph based APIs inside Django's batteries included framework? Christopher Trudeau is back on the show this week, bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. Christopher shares a recent tutorial for building GraphQL APIs in Django using the Python library Strawberry. The tutorial digs into creating a project, defining models, and creating GraphQL queries and mutations using Strawberry. We discuss a blog post from Nat Bennett titled, Why Do Prototypes Suck? We dig into the common pitfalls of building prototypes and the misconceptions between developers and end users. We also share several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a news roundup using HTMX and Fast API, creating an unbelievably stupid airline Wi Fi package, extracting wisdom from conference videos, writing pixel images to the terminal, and a Mac OS app for Jupyter Notebooks. This episode is sponsored by MailTrap, an email delivery platform that developers love. Try for free at mailtrap.io. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher. Welcome back. Hey there. All right, so we don't have a ton of news today. I think we just have like one item. No. um, Which I think everybody can probably expect what it is. You might even be able to guess, yeah. (laughs) It's that late summer, you hear reporters complain about it sometimes. There's nothing, there's no news. And uh, yeah, we've got one tiny little piece of news, which is Python 3.13 has hit beta 4. I will tell you though, I was recently building out a little new course and I was using the REPL a fair amount and I was kind of tired and it took me four attempts to type in the same class because I kept screwing up one line of code for like the five lines of a class. So I'm starting to really look forward to the REPL changes coming in 313. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sure I've this strongly anticipated a release before because usually it's sort of like, yeah, whatever. But this is like, no, no, I, I need the new REPL. Yeah. <laughs> I might I might install the beta just to use the new REPL. So yeah, yeah. anyways. Yeah, it should be fun. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, topics-wise, we have our typical couple topics apiece. We have a discussion and some projects. So I'll start with the topics here. I found an article kind of continuing down this path of uh, me dabbling in the world of HTMX and also kind of messing around with Fast API. This is a tutorial by Paul Esch Laurent on testdriven.io. It's literally titled Using HTMX with Fast API. It's a fairly small project. You get an example application up and running with both those tools, Fast API and HTMX. If you're not familiar with the two of them, I, I would imagine over the last five years, Fast API has gotten a lot of attention, but it's a very fast, modern Python framework for creating APIs. It's all right there in the name. We have a lot of coverage on Real Python about it, if you're interested, in a couple different courses. But yeah, it's a nice way to build an API quickly. It has some features that are advantageous in the sense that it has some async stuff like right out of the box, which is nice. And then... Adding HTMX in the mix, it adds a lot of the server-side sort of rendering capabilities to your HTML, and you don't need those kind of heavy tools of, uh, you talk about somebody becoming a front-end developer and having to learn something like Vue.js or React.js. This is staying in the realm of HTML in a lot of ways, which is nice. You eventually get the project hosted. This is a service I haven't heard of before, uh, so I'm kind of excited about it. It's called render.com. And it's nice to see that there are a, still a few free tier services in existence. So they have a free tier and you can kind of play around with it. Paul provides the whole complete project on GitHub, which is nice, and also shares the hosted instance. So you can kind of check out what the finished product 
will look and kind of play like. The tutorial is very step-by-step, making an environment, pip installing, and doing all those typical stuff. You build out a main.py file, and then that has all the fast API logic with your endpoints in there. And you basically build out template files. In this particular example, you're using Jinja for this. There's an index, you know, your typical landing page for uh, a website, and then a to-do list that then has some of that nice Jinja functionality of being able to do like a the looping functionality that you can do inside of there. And then, of course, HTMX. If you're not familiar with HTMX, uh, I'll also just briefly, I'm trying to find a way to like explain what it is. Uh, if people aren't familiar with it, I, I plan to talk about it a little bit more. Um, you've written some stuff about in your book, so I might ask you a little more about it. But this is from their website. HTMX gives you access to AJAX, CSS transitions, WebSockets, and server sent events directly in HTML using attributes so you can build modern user interfaces with simplicity and the power of hypertext. It's very small, it's dependency free, extendable, and has reduced code bases. They're comparing it like 67% smaller than, you know, something like React. In this particular tutorial, he's using HTMX version two, which is a recent release. I guess my only complaint about the tutorial is that it's, it doesn't really do a lot of deep explanation of what's happening. It's very much follow along with the tutorial, the code shown provides, again, those other resources for you to do deeper research if you'd like. It's more about the functionality and wiring things up and kind of practicing with these tools, which is nice, as opposed to really teaching you what's happening under the hood. Uh, there are some nice touches, pulling in HTMX as a dependency. He does a little bit with CSS to kind of make things look pretty using a library called simple.css. And you get to practice CRUD, which we've talked about a bunch lately. Create, read, update, the you know, sort of editing and delete. And then, again, the end of the thing, which is, again, nice to see a new service providing this, is deploying to render. So, again, I think it'd be good practice for anybody who's interested in getting started with fast API and HTMX. So, thanks, Paul. What are uh, your thoughts on HTMX? I know we were maybe going to talk about this at length in another venue here. I would refer to myself as a fanboy, but the HTMX fanboys on uh, on on the socials are kind of extreme with the memes, so I'm not <laughs> so I'm not sure that I qualify. But uh, yeah, no, I'm a big I'm I'm a big proponent. It drastically simplifies a lot of work. It allows you to use a lot of one, Web 1.0 style technology and still get a lot of the dynamicism that you might want in a in a newer application. Yeah. If you go off to htmx.org, there are some testimonials, I guess, like essays written by people who've converted. And, uh, you know, for example, the one, the 22,000 line site, it took them about two months to convert. They didn't remove, it was a React site, they moved to htmx, they didn't remove any user experience whatsoever. So it was a drop in, a drop in replacement, went from 22,000 lines of code to 7,000 lines of code. Yeah. Their Python went up by 140%, which basically means a bunch of the front-end stuff got moved into the back-end, which makes testing and other things easier. Yeah. 90, what is it? 96% drop in JavaScript dependencies. Interestingly, the it, it even improved the client's experience because the amount of memory in the browser was so much less that they could load more information onto the page. I would imagine the pages would load so much faster with all that overhead. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't just about the page load time. This particular this seemed to be some sort of heavier, like table driven something or other. So okay. it was like they went from having you know some number of rows to to more than that. <laughs> Basically, yeah. you know, th- their upper limit before got to, got pushed out. There's a bunch of these, and you know, and anyone I've talked to that tries to do it, this seems to be the path. There are some things you can't do with it, but most web development doesn't require those things so yeah yeah yeah. and i feel like some of web development has gotten into other cults and things that uh weren't necessarily for the clients and the the end all in the speediness of of the web and I, i think this is a nice change in direction kind of looking at like Let's make things lightweight again. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, you know it's it's insane how much how big some pages are uh, to have very little on them. Yeah, 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 totally. So, what's your first one? I've got a 
let's call it a developer story <laughs> by uh, Robert Heaton. It's called, it's the, the title's a bit of a mouthful, Pi Sky Wi-Fi, Completely Free, Unbelievably Stupid Wi-Fi on Long Haul Flights. Nice. So technically... It's Python content because he used Python to do the work, but it's mostly a story about a bored hacker finding an interesting hole and having some fun with it. So Robert was on a flight from London to San Francisco and was bored enough that he thought he might do some work or, you know, muck around on the internet or something. And he connected to the plane's Wi-Fi login page and was about to jump through the hoops needed to get access when he noticed that he could freely access his frequent flyer account information, which included a button that allowed him to edit the name of his account profile. And as with all good procrastinators, this little crack in the wall was more interesting than getting, say, caught up on his PRs. So he decided to dig in. Robert codes in several different languages, but the joy of having a project named Pi Sky Wi-Fi made him choose <laughs> Python for this implementation. Yeah. So his hack started with a prototype. He actually happened to have a second laptop with him, so he used that to log into the internet and then used the profile name as a message board. So on laptop one, he would freely change the name to, how are you? And then on the second laptop through the internet, he would reply, reply I'm fine. And this kind of takes us back to the title, completely free and unbelievably stupid. So uh, <laughs> this is a slow messaging mechanism, but there's a certain pleasure from finding a legitimate use of a system for other than its intended purposes. So he wrote a little tool that used the profile, pulled the name on both sides, and could exchange messages. Now, at that point, he got a little worried that using the hole would trigger some sort of problem. He, you know... <laughs> don't want to take the entire internet down for the plane. So he stopped. But once he'd proven that it worked, he then signed into the actual flight's internet to start coding this hardcore. And he mocked up how the transmit was done uh, without actually you know, violating somebody's terms of service or whatever. So the end result is the Pi Sky Wi-Fi package, which implements essentially a simplified version of TCP IP over HTTP via frequent flyer account. On the ground, you run a proxy server, and in the air, you use the kit to talk to the proxy server, and then it follows on to do whatever you would normally do over TCP IP. He wisely finishes his little story with the disclaimer that you really shouldn't do this. Yeah. <laughs> and then following all of that, the, the post goes on in detail, does a deep dive in how it all works, uh, and it's, you know, if you're not interested in the second part, it's a fun little bit of reading. If you are interested in the uh, in the second part, he goes into a lot of detail about how all the pieces fit together. That's, uh, you know, some, a little different for, than the normal Python fair. Uh, as I said, we're heading into summer. So, yeah, <laughs> he likes to make these uh, organizational sort of charts and graphs <laughs> it's very cool he's, explaining he's, the transport protocol stuff <laughs> yeah he's, he's got flow diagrams for everything he's also got a bit of a quirky sense of humor yeah. every single time he mentions the name of the frequent flyer program he makes up a different name so you can't actually tell from the article what uh what airline he was on uh, okay yeah so it's a joy to read yeah it's definitely a joy to read <laughs> yeah This episode is sponsored by MailTrap, an email delivery platform that developers love. An email sending solution with industry-best analytics, SMTP, and email API, along with SDKs for major programming languages and 24-7 human support. Try it out for free at MailTrap.io. That's M-A-I-L-T-R-A-P dot I-O. I've had these conversations with Al Swigert a couple times in the past about curating this sort of deluge of conference talks that are out there. Uh, after a conference happens, usually a month, maybe two months later, all of them get posted to usually YouTube. And then they're kind of hard to find in some ways. And they're also kind of hard to sort through as far as like quality and probably the hardest thing about the whole deal is that there's only so many hours in a day as far as watching these things, because they really vary in length, but typically they're, you know, 
half an hour to 45 minutes or maybe potentially up to an hour. And that's a lot to wait through in these days. And so on a similar thought, um, well, he, he was thinking about going through and building a curated list for people to go through and kind of making it like a, a way to learn some of these deeper concepts and going through. And there are some amazing conference talks out there. The trick is sort of finding them. And that was kind of, I think, what was stopping Al at the time. And we were just sort of discussing it. So in the same vein uh, comes an article titled Extracting Wisdom from Conference Videos. And this is a blog post by Gonchialo Valerio. He is writing this on his blog, and the premise is that, again, there's too many of these videos to watch. He was wondering if there was a way to not only find the best videos to watch, but base that on like specific needs that a user would have, and then extract those main things that they're trying to cover and things that they're teaching, and then store it in a consumable and searchable way. And he thought, okay, well, there's lots of these AI tools out here. He didn't want to run them on the larger models that are out there on the web, potentially be leaking any of the data that, that is on the stuff to these external services. So he wanted to run the AI tools locally on his devices. So he goes through and breaks down this entire system of, okay, how am I going to build this tool to search through all this? So he starts with a tool called Olama, which is based on the Llama model. In this case, he's using from Meta, uh, Llama 3, 8B, which I'm guessing these numbers refer to not only the version, but also the sizes of these things. This was what would fit on the machine he was running. The next tool that he was using is something that's called Fabric, and it provides a way to download the transcripts from YouTube videos as a collection. And then he can run a specific prompt pattern upon them. And in this particular one, he's using this thing from Daniel Meisler that's called extract underscore wisdom. So the extract wisdom is doing a little bit more than the typical, let's just summarize the whole thing. It creates a set of categories and then builds up to 10 bullet points for each of these sections. The first one is a summary, which is maybe three or four sentences that summarizes the whole talk. Ideas that were covered insights that you would get out of it, quotes, basically things that were said that would be potentially repeatable as quotable types of things, habits that were introduced, facts that were introduced, references in this case, like we talked about this book or, or something else, a one sentence takeaway, and then some additional recommendations. So he shares a video from PyTexas that Moshe Zatka gave. It was titled Iterate, Iterate, Iterate. You can kind of look through it and get an idea of like, okay, well, what was the summary? What were the ideas that were covered? What were some of the habits that were introduced? Facts are things like the first version of Python was released in 1991 and Guido Van Rossum, the creator of Python, wanted to create a scripting language. And so interesting stuff there. References were a couple different books and then recommendations. A lot of these things end up kind of repeating based upon the talks there. So then he goes into a section of evaluating the results. And again, he's using this one specific example. And it seems to, this tool seems to be focusing on a small part of the video. I, I wonder, again, it's using a transcript of the video. So I'm wondering if there's like a context window size issue potentially with what he's using to look at. So maybe it's only looking at the beginning and at the end or, or something like that, doing some other form of summarization there to figure out what's going to fit it. It often can highlight very superfluous stuff while missing the content that would <laughs> he would classify as important. And then it often can misinterpret what was being said. He only found one occurrence of this, and I think that's from that one particular talk. In general, he found the results to be helpful. Some of the issues he felt like perhaps a bigger model would help, what I mentioned there also, maybe that would provide a, a better context window. The fact that it relies on transcripts also is kind of problematic in the sense that it's going to miss any information that was communicated visually, slides, demonstrations, code running, and things like that. What's nice at, as an end result is that he has created a, a repository of the results of all this stuff. He has five different conferences that he collected this from. PyCon 2024 is not in this, but I would guess that he's going to add it because that was what the article started with. But not only does he have PyTexas, he has DjangoCon Europe 2024, EssoCon, 
FWD forward, I guess, cloud sec, and then B size SF. I think SOCON and maybe these last three I mentioned are all kind of more in the security space or, you know, thinking about cloud kind of development and stuff. So I'm not as familiar with those ones. I picked a couple at random <laughs> myself and did a little bit of a comparison with the actual talk. And whew, one had like a really big flaw. Uh, it was about using sets. And in the notes that is given there, it he mentions that frozen set is mentioned several times, which is kind of an, a nice tool. It's immutable. There's some other kind of nice stuff about frozen sets. At the end of the talk, the presenter was talking with the sort of person hosting the thing, and it was kind of maybe organizing questions. So the summary popped out as this, a presentation on memory profiling and set usage in Python. The speaker discusses their experience using sets and frozen sets for building a snowman and shares insights on handling non-determinism of set ordering across runs. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I was like, what is the snowman thing? And so I had to figure it out. I was got very interested in that idea. So I went back to YouTube and I brought up the transcripts. I couldn't find it. I just searched all around through it. And eventually I just said, all right, let me do a search on the transcripts itself in YouTube, type snowman. And this person who's gathering the questions made a joke. It's like, oh, you know, obviously we'd make a snowman with all these frozen sets or whatever. And the person who's the presenter, you know, just like bypasses it completely. But I feel like the LLM, and this is a problem I kind of have with, I think, LLMs in general, is I think they like shiny objects and loves to pull them out. Like, wow, that's unique and different. We should, you know, put that as part of the summary and, and pull it out of the context, which is weird. And obviously it may not understand the concept of jokes also. So I think your, your mileage may vary. It was really kind of interesting to think about, you know, talks can be pretty long. I think it's nice to be able to get an idea of what's in there. Uh, that's why I wanted to share this. Most LLM things I, I kind of pause on because I, I kind of get annoyed with how a lot of people are trying to replace creativity with LLM usage. And I, I just, that really kind of bothers me. But I think summarizing, saving time, using it to organize thoughts and stuff like that, I think are powerful tools, but I think there's a balancing act to be said there. And it's still, as you can see, requires someone to look at the results. So what's your next one? I've got an article called Developing GraphQL APIs in Django with Strawberry, and it's by Oyuwole Majiyagbe. Before diving in a little bit of background, the most common way of providing an API, a web API, is through REST, which maps URLs to nouns and uses HTTP methods as verbs. So for example, if I was going to look up a person, I might visit slash person slash 42, where 42 is the person's ID number, and then I'd use HTTP get to fetch the information. Or if I wanted to edit that same person, I'd use the same URL, but use an HTTP put instead. And just to tie it back to HTMX, HTMX has those same REST-based pieces inside of it. So when you're mucking around with the page, you get have gets and puts and posts, just, again, all sorts of the HTTP stuff. Anyhow, so uh, REST isn't the only way to do APIs, though. So GraphQL is an alternative that was originally created by Facebook. As an interface, it uses a single URL for everything. And then the actions within the body of the call are what determines whether you're querying something or changing something. So a GraphQL query can name the fields that it's interested in, which tends to mean the content coming back is less verbose than REST APIs. And this is the usually the driver behind people using it. So if you're only interested in the person's name, you can say, hey, I just want this person and their name and not get all the other fields associated with the person. It gives the person calling the API a lot more flexibility than, uh, say, REST does. So if you've got a Django project and you want to add a REST API, there are libraries out there like the Django REST framework or Ninja. And both of these libraries allow you to wire the API endpoints to the database objects. So if I've got a person object in the database, I then use DRF or Ninja and essentially say, hey, that's a person object. Here's a URL. This is how to query. So there are equivalent libraries for GraphQL. 
similar to how the Django REST framework is sort of the big de facto REST library, Graphene is the big de facto GraphQL library. And like Ninja, there's a smaller, somewhat more agile competitor, and that's Strawberry, which is what the article's about. The comparison doesn't actually stop there either. Both Ninja and Strawberry are heavily influenced by Fast API. Yeah, we seem to, we just keep keep doing the callbacks. <laughs> We're in a circle. <laughs> and both of these uh, libraries use decorators and the typing systems. So as a developer, you've got a lot less code to write when creating an API. So the article starts out by explaining why you might choose Strawberry and then runs you through the setup for a sample Django project to use as your test ground. The example project has a database model for a book, which has a title, an author, and a publication date fields. And then to write a GraphQL interface, you need a schema. So the schema defines what data is exposed through the interface. And as you might imagine, that's related to the book object in the database. So to make the book class available through the API, you create a book type schema, uh, you decorate it with a connector to the actual database model, and then you indicate which fields you're interested in. And since most of the information about the field has already been defined with your Django model, you just say, hey, I want auto. And the library takes care of saying, oh, auto means I'll go get the information from Django for you. So the resulting schema ends up looking a fair amount like a data class. You've got a decorator, you've got some class attributes, and it maps to the field names. So when you interact with GraphQL, you do that through queries and mutations. So queries fetch data and mutations change it. Uh, you need to tell GraphQL which queries and mutations you want in the API. So you've got some code to write to do this. Uh, once again, this is done with decorated classes. So to write a query, you use a decorator to indicate that it is a query and provide a Django database query that returns the data involved. So the lookup that returns the books, for example. And then you need to provide a little bit of type information and you're more or less good to go. Mutations are similar. You use the database operations instead of queries and separate things that are sort of like schemas for the fields participating as the inputs. This is kind of like a form object in Django. So if you're posting a form, it's a similar kind of concept. So once you've got all this stuff, you add Strawberry's built-in view, which is called GraphQL view. You add that to your URLs and there you go. You've got GraphQL. So we could have a separate, much longer conversation about whether or not you should GraphQL. I tend to favor REST-based interfaces myself, and there's a fair amount of content out there on the internet as to you know why you might pick one versus the other. If you do favor GraphQL, or you're stuck in a situation where you don't have a choice, Strawberry looks like a much better alternative to Graphene much simpler. And Oyewole does a great job of walking you through all the steps and the article's a great introduction to the topic. So it'd be a good place to start if you dig digging into it. Yeah, I like the top section of it where he spends quite a bit of time basically asking questions like why Strawberry, which is nice, and why Django. And I feel that's some of the stuff that was slightly missing from the previous Test Driven IO article. But yeah, GraphQL... I don't know about the application in this particular case. It's more of like this is a, a toy project to kind of let you see how these things work together. But I don't know if that's a common application of sort of managing books. I, it would. It's essentially just anything that would need a front end API for I, the the project. Really, is uh, you know whatever your Django project is. What whatever typically what you're doing is exposing whatever you have in the database and yeah and putting some controls around it. So, you know, you have to be logged in to do this or yet you don't have to be logged in to do that. So yeah, it's your standard API type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the advantages of using Django there it gets into, which I like too, the, the fact that you have an admin, the fact that you have security and some of the stuff kind of built in, it's a larger footprint than fast API, but it has that functionality too, which is nice. Yeah, well, it's the argument I usually use. I, I like at fast API for very particular things and for prototyping. But like, you know, the fast API example you were giving earlier, you were like, oh, and fast API, and then we have to stick Jinja on top of it. And then, you, yes. and, and that tends to be sort of the situation is by the time you get to a place where you're doing a site that has all the bells and whistles, what you've done is you've imported a half dozen different fast API plugins, and you've just recreated Django. So why not? <laughs> so why not Django is my attitude. So so if I know I'm building something that doesn't need that stuff, then hey, FastAPI, it, it's beautiful. It's, it's a great way of getting something done quickly. 
But as soon as you head to website, well, you need the admin, you need the database. And, and yeah. by the time you add all those pieces, you might as well just be where it's consistent. So, but it, you'd be fair to, to accuse me of having some bias. So, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Buy the book. <laughs> yeah, buy the book. That's right. That's right. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another RealPython video course. It's about building a project using a package we mentioned during this week's episode. It's titled Building a URL Shortener with Fast API and Python. And it's based on a RealPython step-by-step -step tutorial by Philip Xeni. In the video course, Darren Jones shows you how to create a REST API with Fast API, run a development web server with Uvicorn, model a SQLite database, investigate the auto-generated API documentation, and interact with the database with CRUD actions. And then finally, optimize your app by refactoring your code. This step-by-step -step project and course is intended for Python programmers who want to try out Fast API and learn about API design, CRUD, and how to interact with the database. And if you need some help along the way, RealPython has you covered there with additional video courses and tutorials covering all the suggested requirements. RealPython video courses are broken into easily consumable sections, and where needed, include code examples for the techniques shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the Enhanced Search tool on realpython.com. Yeah, this kind of leads us into this uh, discussion topic, which I, I think is really interesting. You have way more experience in building these types of things, but do you want to do the introduction here to the discussion? Sure. Our conversation this week is inspired by a post that was from earlier this year by Nat Bennett, and the title of it was, Why Do Prototypes Suck?, and in fact, the subtitle gives you a little bit of insight as well. The subtitle is, why is it exactly that prototypes are so miserable to maintain and operate? And how can we avoid putting prototypes in production? So yeah. Nat starts out by admitting to using prototypes a lot, usually to do a proof of concept, rather than say creating a long spec for their team or to quickly get feedback, a prototype can be useful. The post goes on to say that Prototypes are dangerous because no one actually throws them away. <laughs> uh, once you've got it working, it's too tempting to just put it into production. So to try to understand why prototypes often end up being messy, Nat's article drills down on some commonalities. They usually don't have tests. They usually don't have design docs or any documentation. Yeah. They often hard code values. Where it's that whole quick and dirty thing. And sometimes they're not even written in a team's core language, which I, I thought I hadn't come across that point before, but I thought it was kind of an interesting concept. Because mm. again, if you're doing something quick and dirty, you might stick something together in Python because you're a Python person and it's quick to do it. But if the team isn't a Python team, now you're supporting that. So yeah, what was your take here? You have any prototype horror stories? Well, I think about that first comment that you you kind of added there the idea of you might not only not be using your normal language which i haven't run across as much but i think the other problem is you may not be using your normal tools <laughs> yeah you know this is something that's happening on potentially a, a, an individual's workstation and you get it up and running and you bring people over and say here i'm trying to show you this you know, running on my machine, or maybe you you can put it on the intranet and you can then bring it up in the conference room or what have you, and you can show logging in and, you know, hey, this thing is working. And then suddenly your entire team around you go, well, that's great. Let's use that. And you're like, no. <laughs> it's like, well, what's the problem? Well, it's running on my machine. Well, that's not a problem, is it? And it's like, well, yeah, it is. Like, I... <laughs> I don't want this running on my machine and using the company intranet. There's like a hundred reasons for why and then trying to like go through and enumerate all those <laughs> reasons, uh, you know, besides like security, besides the fact that, oh, IT pushes updates and, and so forth. But this was like a common thing that happened to me and it depends on the environment. It depends on the development environment and the type of like, we were creating lots of fast and dirty tools and automating them and so forth. But that was like always 
the simple dirty answer is just running on your local machine and i was like i would really prefer you know we we talked about docker oh well they have an approved linux it's like okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, we haven't improved ways of securing this, so just stick it on your box until the until then. Yes, yeah. It's... We literally looked at running Docker with Windows uh, images, and it was just like, oh my god! And that was like such a hassle. And we just kept running into all these types of things where, like, you, normally you could maybe, if we had an account that was set up to do some kind of cloud hosting, then and that was all sort of you know set up and so forth. But that was always the trick. And then, yeah, I agree with the rest of it. It's like, it's not documented. There aren't tests and, and, and so forth. I've seen, you know, prototype types of things that are literally just scripts. Maybe they were even running in a, in a notebook. Who's going to be able to run that, you know, as, a, as an end user? You have to have somebody there who, who can, like, <laughs> help the person run it. It's like, this, this isn't the solution. Give me the time. Yeah. I, and the problem is that that's the, the thing. They, they, they're like, well, you're 90% done. I'm like, no, no, I'm 10% done. And the, yeah, well, you're ninety percent done, and then the last ten percent takes the other ninety percent. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, I, I think one of the challenges often is you very seldom think about edge cases when you're doing prototyping. Right. So you know I've got some data and it's clean, and I put it in, and I get the output. And then the real world is the data isn't clean, and we haven't thought about that. And there's all these cases, and and in the in the case of a prototype, almost every one of those cases will cause it to fall over. And right. It varies from organization to organization, but there there tends to be a fundamental disconnect between IT and business. Um, and there isn't a good understanding on the business side of what is involved in things. And I, I've run into this a lot where, oh, oh, I can see the GUI, therefore it must be done. And in fact, it's one of the things that with teams I've worked with before, I try to make sure that we don't build the GUI first. Because as soon as the GUI's done, people go, oh, I can push the button. The work must be finished. And <laughs> yeah. whereas, whereas the terminal is scary, right? So if like, right, oh, right. well, I see that in the terminal. No I end user is going to possibly use that. <laughs> exactly, right? So there, there's, this, there's this sort of, oh, I, okay, I understand that it's not there yet. And I, for better or for worse, I, I'm, I'm going to say some agile stuff, and I'm sure that causes some people's eyes to just roll. But uh, there's a concept in agile delivery where they try to separate the what from the how. Hmm. And so you've got, you know, the user story is the requirements, and then the definition of done is the how we're going to achieve those requirements. Ignoring the fact that it's a horrible name, you're not supposed to consider something to be finished unless it meets both. And so that's things like the documentation, that's things like the testing. And the business doesn't often seem to, well, they don't see the how because they don't understand it. And they often don't understand the long-term implications of not having good how. Yeah. And that's where things like technical debt come from. And it tends to just sort of snowball. And eventually you get to a place where it's it's really, really problematic. And it's funny because the business often ends up having the attitude of, well, it's just the IT people are just being picky. They're just slowing us down. And the IT people are probably trying to be good stewards because they're the ones who are going to have to maintain the thing, right? So, right. I think about the number of people involved in developing it too. Like, it, prototypes are often a, a singular yes. person, and that's great. But like, how are you sharing that with the rest of the team and and explaining how the thing works and and so forth? And so that's why like his suggestion of like, let's shred this thing now. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I, I don't, one of the things that I've done with things like design documents is I will very intentionally make sure that the design documents, the pictures of the screens are not picture perfect. They're not what the output would look like. I almost always want them to be like, look as if they're hand-drawn sort of wireframes. And it helps separate the idea of we're talking about the concept on the page rather than exactly what it looks like. And I think when you're prototyping, you kind of need that same thing. You need something that somebody looks at and goes, oh, that's stinky, uh, but it gets the idea across. And the closer it looks to being like it might be something you could use, the more likely someone is going to pull the trigger and say, oh, let me just use that. Yeah. I, I think sometimes developers were our own worst enemies because you know you you don't necessarily make it clear what uh, what is and isn't or what it won't be or whatever i used to use emojis in test data or in stub data 
And often it would be like the little poop emoji. And this is just sort of a reminder of this is hard coded. This is not coming out of the file. This is this is Laura Ipsum, <laughs> right? And it just, and just sort of having the little poop emoji everywhere is like, okay, yeah, none of that's actually wired. You're seeing a pretty picture, and that's all it is. So trying to trying to convey that to the business is uh, is sometimes difficult. That's interesting. <laughs> Do you have any other like horror stories of that of people wanting to hold on to the prototype? It's it's almost cliche in the industry. I've experienced the same thing that you have where ghost IT happening underneath people's desks. Yeah. I, I don't see it as much as I used to. And I don't know whether that's because my clients are larger organizations now. So there's more of the, we must do it a certain way. Some of it may also come down to some of the tools that used to abuse this a lot, right? Like, oh, just just go use Fox Pro or just go use an Access database. Nobody uses those things anymore. So I do wonder whether there's a certain robustness to to the stack that is causing it to happen less, or maybe I've just gotten luckier. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think you're just not seeing it. <laughs> it's, it's possible. It's quite possible. Yeah, I mean, you think about the number of databases that are Excel files and and things like that, you know, this is like, that's a, a, you know, slightly adjacent type of thing, but, but similar. That's, that's almost my point because, because you can do a lot of that stuff in Excel, no one thinks you can put Excel into production. Oh, okay. It does. It doesn't come up. So when it's, they it's get ugly to the, enough of a thing where they're yeah. like, we shouldn't do this. When, when they get yeah. to the point of, oh, we no longer we have to replace the Excel sheet because now fifteen people have to interact with it, or it's fragile, or whatever. That's when project money spawn, spawns up, right? Okay. So I do wonder whether uh, whether that's part of it. I think the. The fact that there are more powerful ad hoc tools out there may cause there to be fewer prototypes or it's ob- more obvious what is in that land and what isn't. Yeah, that's interesting. I th- there were so many of these sort of like database slash interface yeah. in a tool kind of thing, po- Fox Pro, the XS, whatever, FileMaker, uh, things like that, where like you could do quite a bit of it. And and potentially run it on a singular machine yeah. or across things. Yeah. And I suspect the web has something to do with it as yeah. well, because right. I, a lot of these things were used as uh, were used as internal things, yeah. right? So you're in an organization, you throw it in there, and it's like, oh, it's fine, it, it, it'll be fine. And as soon as you have to put it to the web, there's certain work that has to be done to get that to happen. Right. Um, and so I Who's think going to be able to access it, security, yeah. all that stuff, right away. Yeah. So yeah. I, so I think it, it it may have become a little more obvious. But yeah, it's uh, yeah that I'm sure it's still happening. And, right, and right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the fact that you can very quickly build, you know, a set of APIs and so forth with something like Fast API, but then it's like you got to add everything else to it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that kind of continues our discussion there. Well, I think that takes us into projects. I have a project this week that I just found this thing. It, I want to caution a little bit. It seems to be a very interesting project. I can't tell if this is going to be a commercial offering. It is in alpha, so be aware of that. The project is called Saturn, spelled S-A-T-Y-R-N, and it's a Mac OS app for Jupyter Notebooks. So the idea is that you can run your Jupyter Notebooks in a kind of a prettier environment. Like It made me immediately think of this trend over the last... I don't know how many years it is, maybe eight years, where there were a lot of these applications that would take away everything on your computer screen, sort of distraction-free, and just put a piece of paper so you could write. You know, like um, the, this distraction-free writing environment. And I think that's kind of what this is in a way, a distraction-free notebook. It's very pretty. It still has the same kind of cells and and so forth. From what I can tell, it's running on Electron uh, in in some way there. It's a very minimal interface. It has very fast startup time. They kind of are trying to compare it a lot to running Jupyter Notebooks inside of VS Code or Jupyter Lab, which both can be pretty cluttered. Did you just say, did you just say Electron and fast startup time in the same sentence? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, VS Code and Jupyter, I, I know VS Code is, well, I don't know. It's probably not Electron, but it does take a minute to load sometimes. At least maybe with the Jupyter environment stuff. I don't know. 
anyway, I did, I played with it a little bit. The reason I think it potentially is also a commercial offering is that it has the ability to to help you with generating code and having context aware prompt cells. So it has some of this AI functionality built in with open AI initially built in. And then there's some mentions of some other stuff. It has a command palette, which I think is kind of nice. You can quickly open up what are the common key commands that you want to use inside there. It has a black code formatting. So you can just hit F to format your code. Real quick way to copy graphs and tables with just a click of a button. It takes a little bit to set up. Initially, you do need to sort of manage the kernel. So you still would maybe open up a terminal and and run the commands to to get a virtual environment set up and pip install everything. And then you can add that kernel, if you will, as a, a, a resource for Saturn to be using. One kind of pleasant thing that I was a little nervous when I initially pushed the button to install. It takes you to this quick form that asks some questions. And I was like, oh, no, this is where they're going to ask me for my email. And it didn't, which I was like, okay, I'm thankful for that. It was more asking kind of survey type questions about like, what are you using now? What don't you like about it? And then I can't remember what the third question was. I think maybe the, what uh, industry are you in? Um, There's links to a Discord. There is a single blog post that, kind of talks about one of the things they're dealing with a language server protocol. It links to a GitHub account of Jack Hodkinson. I don't know if that's the person who's behind Saturn or not, or just somebody who's working on the project, but uh, I'm intrigued by it. Again, it's Mac only. You get to pick when you go to install an ARM or Intel Mac processor as far as it running. I'm intrigued by it in the sense that I occasionally need to do stuff in Jupyter Notebooks, and this seems like a, a kind of a pretty way to run them on a Mac. So. Watch this space. What's your project? I've got something called Rich Pixels, which is by Darren Burns, who's one of the textual folks. The library sits on top of Rich, which is a core component of textual and the the thing that actually draws to the terminal. So what Rich Pixels does is it takes images and then uses that same Rich interface to create a pixelized version of the images on your terminal. It has a from image function, which can be used to read your typical JPEG or PNG or pretty much anything I think that Pillow can read. And then it outputs that to the terminal. So I'll warn you, when playing with this, I used a fairly large image and it treats a cursor sized block as a pixel. So if you've got a 700 line image, you're going to get 700 lines output to the screen. So your scroll bar can go flying by a little quickly there. In addition to being able to read an image, you can also use the from ASCII method, which allows you to draw ASCII art to the terminal. It even allows you to map a character to a color. So you can use an X and an O and dashes or whatever, and then say that X means blue and dash means red or however you go. So essentially, it's a little painting mechanism as it is. So. I'm not entirely sure what I'd ever do with this. (laughs) Uh, But if you're already building TUIs and say you want a logo or something along those lines, or you just really like some ASCII art, it's a fun little project. Uh, Always, there's always seems to be good stuff coming out of the textual folks. Yeah, I thought about like, (laughs) if you're making a pixel game or you're into pixel art in general, like um, creating avatars or other kinds of things from pictures. All right. Well, uh, thanks for bringing all these articles and projects this week, Christopher. Always fun. All right. Talk to you soon. Cheers. And don't forget, this episode was brought to you by MailTrap, an email delivery platform that developers love. Try it out for free at MailTrap.io. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show again. And I want to thank you for listening to The Real Python Podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.